I'm the head of the Maples History Center here at King Family Library, and I just want to welcome everyone to our Juneteenth celebration, um, otherwise known as Emancipation Day, um, which commemorates the final end of slavery in the United States when Federal Major General 
Gordon Granger ordered the final enforcement of the Emancipation Proclamation on June 19, 1865. Our celebration this evening focuses on the history of black music from spirituals to modern gospel. We are honored and pleased to have the very talented Kenya family singers um, from the Boys Creek Church of God here with us today, and they will be performing some of these spirituals and sharing with you some of the history behind this music. Uh, but first, let us set the stage with a brief introduction. <coughs> there are roughly four million enslaved Africans in the United States. Forcibly transplanted to a new land, they brought with them a rich African heritage, including songs. Adapted to reflect the experiences of life of hard labor on plantations, these slave work songs, laments, and shouts of protest evolve into a new musical form, the spiritual. The spiritual will in turn become the wellspring for generations of musicians who will create the blues, gospel, jazz, and the protest songs of the 1960s. In June 1619, a Dutch ship, ship arrived in Jamestown, Virginia with 20 Africans who were quickly sold into slavery. Thus, the dark state of slavery began in American history. Between 1526 and 1867, 12.5 million captured men, women, and children were put on ships in Africa. 10.5 million actually arrived in the New World, North and South Af America and the Caribbean. To put this number into context, of the nearly 800,000 immigrants to the United States between 1607 and 1775, 40% were slaves. They came from principally West African nations, and they brought with them many different customs, including mu musical traditions from their native lands. African slaves in America learned European choral traditions and were introduced to Christianity after attending church services with their owners. They mixed these European traditions with their own styles and customs. They sang in worship and in the fields as they worked. Music became their solace, and without it, and without a strong faith in God, our ancestors wouldn't have survived the pain and anguish they endured. They sang about living conditions as slaves, about punishments endured and the separation of families. Oh, Oh, 
wanna let nobody turn me around. Oh, turn me around. Oh, turn me around. I don't wanna let nobody turn me around. I'm gonna keep on a walking, a keep on a talking. Marching up to freedom land. Ain't gonna let no hatred. Negro spirituals were founded in the cruelty of slavery because the ability to read and write were denied to the slaves. They were passed orally from generation to generation. Therefore, many of these same songs have been sung differently with different words in different generations. We are now distributing a copy of one of these songs called No Man Cannot Hinder Me. This is printed from the Slave Songbook, which was a compilation of spirituals published in 1867 by abolitionists in New York. It is important to note that the versions of these songs were as they were at that moment in time in 1867, so these are not even the original. We don't actually know what the original version of this song sounded like, and it is different from the version that we will hear today. Um, so the choir is now going to sing that modern version, as you will see the original lyrics from 1867 before you. I'm determined to walk with Jesus. Yes, I yes, am. I am. Yes, I am. I'm determined to walk with Jesus. Yes, I yes, am. I am. Yes, I am. Through hard trials, hard trials, tribulations, tribulations, persecutions, persecutions.
A spiritual is a religious folk song. These songs can be happy or sad, but they always include references to the Bible. Slaves identified with Old Testament stories about Hebrew children and their flight from bondage in Egypt. They often turn these biblical references into coded messages that told others about the Underground Railroad and how to flee to the north. Sometimes even a story of a planned escape was communicated in this way as the slaves worked together, all with the master none the wiser. The code word in the Negro spirituals often related to means of escape. For instance, a chariot may mean a train, and other examples can be found in the gospel train as an I'm going to take a trip on a good old gospel ship, swing low, sweet chariot, or wade in the water. The tempo and rhythm of these songs were communicated by swaying of the head and body as they marked the beat and engaged the audience. We are now going to hear a few of these escape songs performed, namely Gospel Ship and Wade in the Water. Well, I'm gonna take a trip in that good old If you don't believe I've been reading 
believe God wanted that song written just the way it was written, just so that we would be reminded that as Christians, whether black or white, free or bond, in his eyes, we're all connected. We are connected. So as we listen to this music today and reflect on the past, we must not forget that these songs were forged in the pain of the oppressed, as Whitley Phipps has just um, illustrated. Slaves lifted their spirits to God and cried for relief in times of trouble, um, but they also established a future for all of us. Uh, Paul T. Kwani, director of the Fisk Jubilee Singers, reaffirms this biblical charge given by the Apostle Paul, saying, let us now run the race that is set before us by faith so that we can achieve our goals to the glory of God. Now most of these songs were sung a cappella or with rudimentary instruments, and we will now explore some of those instruments. We have on display here, um, on loan, many instruments that would have been familiar to the first generations of enslaved people in the United States. Um, they are generally percussion instruments and a couple string instruments, like the djembe drum, that tall instrument. Um, they are generally, except for the drums, all made from gourd gourds that were native to West African nations at that time. And except for the drum, all of the instruments, and except for the modern banjo, on this left side of the table are made from gourds. There are replicas of the original instruments that were made 400, 500, 600 years ago, but they're made in the traditional way. So exactly the same as this enslaved peoples would have been used to. Um, so we have also shakers um, like the shakire, that is the instrument with the little beads um, in the center. Um, we have kazizi, which are like the maraca type instruments near the front of the table. Um, interestingly, the, the kazizi were believed to ward off evil spirits. Now, of course, these instruments or something like them were illegal for most slaves in the United States to have um, and to make because these uh, slavers believed that these slaves could communicate with each other across distances um, by using drums and other percussion instruments. But interestingly, the djembe drum um, is actually a peace instrument. The name itself comes from the Bambara language with J meaning to gather, and bay meaning peace. So the instrument was to gather together in peace. But the slaves themselves, we have seen with the spirituals, actually commandeered hymns for their coded messages to freedom. Um, but one African instrument um, that has become very important to Appalachian culture is the banjo. Um, we have here, and I can't really get around with the cord to the microphone, um, these are ancestors of the banjo called the Kora. They're called the Kora. They have the five note scale uh, that we saw in the video. Um, and you can see some similarities to the modern banjo in the basic construction of it. Um, they were made from split gourds and stretched animal skins. Um, so the slaves were able to easily recreate these with whatever that they found um, in America. And the term banjo itself comes from the Mandika language of Gambia, with banjo being the capital of that region. And, um, and you all are welcome afterwards to come up and look at these instruments. I just ask not to touch them because, oh, they are replicas, they're still quite fragile. Uh, but you're welcome to take pictures or, or whatever you wish to. Um, but they also created instruments, as I've said, from everyday objects that they found. If they couldn't have a, a formal drum, they would use wash tubs. We have an example of wash tubs at the end that James Zane brought in. Um, we have washboards as well. <laughs> and 
we have a cowbell and a tambourine. what we call the hand bone. We do not have someone here today to demonstrate the hand bone, but it was using your hands as an instrument, so I'll show a short video of that example. I serve as a Sevier County historian, and on behalf of the Key Family Library, let's give them a round of applause. <laughs> and uh, the Martin Luther King uh, Celebration Committee. And by the way, Judge Dwight Stokes wanted me to uh, let everyone know that he sent his regrets. He's out of town on business, or he would have been here with us tonight. But I just wanted to briefly talk a little bit about our local black history and the impact it's made on this community. In the days of enslavements, when most of these great singers were uh, slaves on the Wheatlands Plantation in Boyd's Creek, all they had to live for was their faith. That's all that got them through those days. And for 200 years they've kept that singing going and the fact that they gained their freedom in 1865 didn't stop the singing and most of us here have heard it and know how beautiful it's been down through the years but the uh, black citizens of Sevier County have left a, an impact even greater than just the singing you have you don't have to look any further than downtown Sevierville to see the impact of the architecture and most of that was done by the Dockery McMahon families back around the turn of the century. And it still stands as a testament to their artist stability and what they left for Sevier County. We have what I call our own Sevierville brick right here in town, thanks to them. But uh, down through the years, uh, the music kept flowing. And Sam Bibb, who was once enslaved at Boyd's Creek, came into town after the Civil War and used to sit and sing playing a banjo with the, um, on those very streets where the uh, McMahon and Dockery families had bent the bricks and he would sing as a minstrel there on the streets to make a living. 
uh, New Salem Baptist Church uh, built by Isaac Dockery. Uh, the singing when I was a boy that come out of that church was would just make uh, your hair your the hair on your arms stand up. It was so beautiful. I remember one elderly lady named M. Rimmel who could hum better than most people could sing. It was just uh, melodious the way she would hum old spirituals. And the summertime, the windows would be up in the church and you could hear it for miles around on some days. And it was just absolutely beautiful. And of course, uh, there was the Boyd's Creek Church of God who has played a large impact on the uh, community for several generations. I remember as a boy, and you all probably think I'm, I'm a lot older than what I am, uh, but I remember some of your grandparents singing with the choir at Boyd's Creek, and they'd go all over the county and they would sing, and there was a lot more of them then than there is now, and, and the music was just absolutely beautiful. And thank you so much for carrying on that uh, legacy and that heritage. It's something to be proud of. And I think we should give them all a big round of applause. Big thanks to James Ena Miller and to, I mentioned Lisa already, and to, and to Nicole and Missy for the part you played in getting this uh, excellent program together tonight. We thank you very much. And I think I would be amiss here today, not to mention that we have the mother of the founder of the Martin Luther King Day celebration, Miss Betty McMahon, with us tonight. Okay, could you play the cowbell for us, Ben? <laughs> you brought it, you should play it. <laughs> and and we, we're always eternally grateful for your son and what he did for us. And Joe's entire family's here, or most of them are tonight, uh, for what he, he's done for this uh, black community as well. And I, I was asked to mention that the uh, Friends of the Seymour Library have some copies of their Boyd's Creek book, the award-winning Boyd's Creek book back there. Uh, if, if any of you don't have a copy yet, it tells, uh, it's an excellent history of the whole Boyd's Creek, Seymour area, and there's a lot of black history in that book as well. And at four o'clock next Sunday, there's a we're launching a companion map to the book. So many people said, if I had a map, I knew where these places were. So Steve Petty will present a program on the map and we'll have the maps for sale. There are quality uh, maps for framing, uh, but also for use uh, with the, uh, the book. It's 4 o'clock at the Williams Family Seymour Library. Thank you. And thank all of you for being here tonight, and uh, we're going to close the program with some energetic music, and uh, so welcome back the Chandler Family Singers. I have a picture of everybody, because if I can have it, so I can get a picture of everybody. <laughs>
Everybody will be happy over there. Oh, there is power in the blood. That's why I'm covered and I'll fly away. All right. All right. Amen. Are you glad to be here? Yeah. Did you enjoy yourself tonight? Yeah. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. 